Today is Abishuva. Traditionally, in, uh, in the Orthodox tradition, generally they do a whole lot of liturgy and they do very few real message messages, but this is one of two Sabbaths of the year, two of the, two of the greater Sabbaths, that when a sermon message would be done in the synagogue. I don't know if y'all know that. The other one is Shabbat Haggadah, which is the Sabbath before Passover. And on those two occasions, is generally the only time you'll really hear a sermon message in a synagogue. And this is the Of course, Sabbath Shuba is the Sabbath of Mark for return. That uh, it is the. Uh, the day that uh, we're supposed to render ourselves and have our last opportunity during the day of the law, the end day, between trumpets and a coma, to turn back to Yahweh. The traditional half quarter readings are Hosea 14 2, which uh, we read that before. You know, take the devil read or words and return to Yahweh, uh, offering the bulls of your lips or the words of your lips. They generally read Joel 2, and we read Joel 2 about Yahweh's army and call a fast, return to Yahweh, rent your heart in Joel 2. They also read Micah 7, 18, and 20. And let's go to Micah 7. <coughs> Micah 7, 18, and 20. Or 18, 3, 20. Micah 7, 18. Who is, who is an ill like unto thee? that pardon of iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquity and he will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Generally that is uh, generally also read on the day of trumpet. And that is the casting away of sin that we look forward to in the end of this. There are some things about Yahweh casting off her problems and redoing uh, or re, uh, if you will, working with on this Teshuvah as we turn to Him. And this turning to Him kind of has the aspect of us renting our heart back to Him. And I want to go to Acts 24, 16. I want, I want to, we have some people in here that like to work out, you know? And uh, they like to be physically fit, do things that they need to do for the body. But these right here, I want to look at this in, uh, what word are you here looking at? Word of Yahweh. The word of Yahweh, okay. And I want to look at, what we're going to look at, we're going to focus on exercise. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards Elohim and towards men. Do we exercise, if you will, if we exercise, that muscle gets stronger, don't it? So are we exercising in this way to prepare ourselves so that when we come before Yahweh, we're in good shape? Is, is the point here. I'm going to 1 Timothy 4 7. Got a ton of scriptures here today. Uh, it's easy to get overloaded and get more than we will get through. First Timothy 4, 7 and 8. But refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto holiness. For bodily exercise profits little. But holiness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that it now is and of that which is to come. So what, what are we exercising? When we exercise the body, it's possible to do it. You know? Not, I mean, it's, not, but it's talking about the exercise is going to profit you into eternity. I hope y'all see the hugeness of that exercise. He's talking about you were to work on that. I'm going to go to Hebrews 5.14. But strong.
strong meat belongs to them are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. As we exercise our faith, and I'm telling you what, as we exercise our faith, and, and, the, and the word exercise, again, is to strengthen. And we exercise our faith, starting with little minute things when we lean on Yahweh. Now, a lot of us aren't very strong in the faith because we don't exercise our faith. We don't lean on any of the little things. So when the big things come along, we fold because we haven't exercised that muscle to have it strong enough so that we can be strong in the big things. Hope y'all are seeing this principle here. That if I lean on Yahweh in the little things, like providing for me food and shelter and those things, then when the big things come along like the knives at my throat, I will have the faith to fulfill what I need to fulfill. Well, I really like that a lot. In other words, if I haven't exercised myself to that faith, I'm not going to be strong enough to withstand those things when I get to it. I want to go one more. Let's go to Hebrews 12, 11, and then... Now, no chastising for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. We're exercised, going through a few trials. If we are faithful to Him in that trial, if we're not faithful to Him, that trial exercises nothing. If we fold up. I hope y'all see that principle. We have to stay strong in this. 2 Peter 2.14, there are some that exercise themselves in the wrong direction. 2 Peter 2.14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls of heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Which way are we exercising? Nobody sees me in the dark, do they? You know? Nobody sees what I'm doing, nobody looking. See, where your strength is, if your strength lies in Yahweh, and you've exercised yourself to be in that position, then when the time comes, you'll be strong enough to fulfill what you need to do. Yahweh chose the people for himself and made a covenant with that people. With that people, we made it up. I want to go to Deuteronomy 10 and 15. We're going to look at this covenant that Yahweh makes with the people. Hopefully, uh, Deuteronomy 10 and 15. Only Yahweh had a delight in their fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them. Even you, above all people, as it did this day, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff neck. You know the stiff neck part of this? You ever ride a horse and try to turn him, he wouldn't turn? He's stiff neck. Are we supposed to turn to Yahweh? And he's saying, he's stiff neck, he won't turn. Just like that animal, he won't turn. You ever wonder what it's still there? Circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Now a lot of people think that's a New Testament concept that isn't Old Testament. To circumcise your heart, not your flesh. Now let's go to Genesis 26, 41. And I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they accept the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember, and I will remember the land. That's ill. Ill. They cut the flesh away from their heart. How do you cut the flesh away from your heart? Maybe by exercising 
faith in Yahweh and moving away from the world and moving away from exercising yourself in the world and exercise yourself towards Yahweh. Let's go back and look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And that's actually in this poor course. That's the poor course of last year. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And Yahweh thy Elohim will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed. It's all about your descendants. You me? Not just them, but he's saying, hey, I'm going to take care of your kids. I'm going to take care of those coming after you. It's a part of your seed to love Yahweh thy Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind that you may be. So we really love him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. Let's look at some more of this. Jeremiah 4 4. Now let me get a little bit more of it. Circumcise yourself to Yahweh and take away the foreskin of your heart, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Make my fury come forth like a siren burn that none can quit, yet because of the evil of your doings. You would think, let's go to Jeremiah 9.25. I thought that was a New Testament concept, circumcise your heart. Behold, the day has come, I say to Yahweh, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised, Edom of Judah and Edom, and the children of Ammon and Moab, and all that are in the uttermost corners of the world of the wilderness. For all the nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in their heart. In other words, we're all fleshly. We're all exercising ourselves with the world. We're exercised chasing our gods of money and gold and all of the things the world chases after. Acts 7, 51. I know it's kind of boring to go through a whole lot of scripture here, but you're going to have to put up with it. <laughs> <laughs> Ye still neck, there we go again, I can't turn them, and uncircumcised in heart, and ears you do always resist the Holy Spirit as your father did, so do you. I hope that's not us. I really hope that's not us. I hope that we have that heart to turn, to turn to him in the land of our captivity. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain him with his sword, with the sword before, before of the coming of the just one, in whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. What he's saying is, guess what? Y'all are wicked just like your forefathers were, so you're going to kill the prophets just like they did because you do not want to be corrected. Since you won't be corrected and you will not turn and you continue to go the wrong way, you will kill the prophets because you don't like the message just like your evil forefathers didn't like the message and killed the prophets. That's exactly what the Messiah said there. There you go there. If you don't time with your whole heart, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to do the same thing. I hate saying that. But I'm not saying it. Yahweh is. Romans 2.28 For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of him, but of Elohim. Are we circumcised through the shoe of the Messiah? In other words, yielding ourselves to him, willing to turn to him with all the everything leaving nothing in return. Colossians 2.11 In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of the side. Buried with him in that 
that's death in him and that. In other words, I died to the old man. Flesh is gone. I am now a spiritual being living up to him in the, in the spiritual realm, doing spiritual things, going forward to a become an actual spiritual being. Born again, if you will. When we keep Yahweh's law, we become part of the chosen people and partakers of the covenant. Ephesians 2 11. Ephesians 2 11. Wherefore, remember that you being in past, past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Basically, you can take this thing uncircumcised and circumcised and you can actually kind of render in the covenant or not in the covenant is what he's saying. If you want to look at circumcision in that way, and we come into the covenant through Messiah. In other words, the circumcision that we have through Messiah brings us into the covenant that is the circumcision that we receive with the heart not the literal cutting of the flesh of the, of the fleshly member but the flesh of the heart is cut away in the side that's how we enter the covenant that at that time you were without the Messiah being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel wait I thought he threw Israel away you're saying through Messiah we become part of the commonwealth of Israel how's that work and strangers from the covenants of promise. Wait. I thought all of those covenants was gone and now it's in the Messiah since he circumcised our heart. We don't have any of that. We just got the Messiah, right? No. He brings us into the commonwealth of Israel and into the good graces of the covenant because we fell out of the covenants because of sin. Sin brought us away from Yahweh. So we're no longer in the covenants of that. Through Yeshua the Messiah, cutting away the flesh of our hearts, we can actually become part of real Israel and part of the covenants of promise. And he said that when we were separated from that, we had no hope and without Yahweh in the world. Because sin had separated us. We were lost, part of the nations. Now we're restored to the covenants. We're restored to the good graces. So now we can appear before the Father in heaven. As it said, Yeshua the Messiah went in there with His blood. I have a ticket where I can get an audience with the Father through Him. Through His blood. That's, that's the ticket I got to go in and appear before the Father. Through the land. He read the blessing. He put me back in good graces into the covenant so that I can go and hear before the Father. That is huge. To me, that's a huge deal. But what do we do when we get there? To me, we're, uh, we're clearly just a bunch of small children. Uh, but now, in the side of Yeshua, we were sometimes far off or made nigh by the blood of the Son brought back. Hallelujah. Let's go to uh, to think about this. Yahweh and Yeshua didn't actually choose us because we were so mighty and so good. I know a lot of people that think they're pretty good. You know, they barely needed any saving. You know, I hardly had any sin at all. I'm so pure. Such a good person. First Corinthians 1 27. But Elohim has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And Elohim has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, which things are despised, has Elohim, Elohim chosen. Yea. And things which are not, which are not, to bring to naught things that are all, that no flesh should boast in the presence of Elohim. 
In other words, if you really think you're a high and mighty, something it says, he didn't, he didn't choose the high and mighty. He chose us. Go look in the mirror. We're not the, we're not the high and mighties of the world. If he did choose the high and mighties of the world, then he would have nothing to show the world. Look what I chose and look I did this and these people. That I would imagine someday, when hopefully we're built to the world, hopefully I'm there, there will be a people that will be might be a jaw dropper for some people to see me there in that position. Uh, you know, I'm not to live so live such a pristine life. Deuteronomy 7-7. Yahweh did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. Because Yahweh loved you and because Yahweh would keep the oath which he had sworn to his fathers, that Yahweh brought you out with a mighty hand to redeem you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. We are such a weak people. And history bears out that the Israelite people are a weak people because they always end up being overtaken and pull it into servitude without Yahweh's hand with them. In other words, the evil peoples of the world are stronger and mightier nations, just like when he led them into the, into the land. Seven nations stronger and mightier than you are in there. Yes, they were stronger and mightier than them. But it's the hand of Yahweh that delivers them. And it's the hand of Yahweh that's going to deliver us, yielded to him. It's not by our own strength. I think that principle is in there, but we don't realize that we're not high and mighty people. We are weak people, and the only reason we are a people is because of Yahweh. Are y'all seeing this? I hope so. Thank you. It is Yahweh that brings us. And he brought us into covenant. He took the people before the mountain, and he made a covenant with the people, a ketubah. You know what a ketubah is? It is a marriage contract that the man and the woman got together, and they made this contract with we stood before the mountain, the ketubah, that Bible, that book that we carry around, is actually our ketubah. It was read from the mountain, and we all said, I do. It shouldn't be as I do, we should say, I will. I will do that. That's what they said. All they always said, I will do, is what should have taken place there. Last week in Deuteronomy 29.10, there was a prophecy given of how Israel would turn from the covenant to the, the Ketubah that they agreed to. 29.10. You stand this day, all of you, before Yahweh your own hand, your captains, your tribes, your elders, your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, stranger that is in the council, and the hewer of the wood under the drawer of thy water, that thou should have entered into covenant with Yahweh thy Elohim and into his oath. Okay, we're entering into covenant with him. An oath which Yahweh thy Elohim makes with you this day. Basically, the covenant is a two-way treat. We agree to do whatever he says. At the mountain, they said, yes, all that Yahweh says, we will do. In other words, that's before they even heard the law. They hadn't heard the law. They hadn't heard the things he said. They said, doesn't matter. He's Yahweh. Whatever he says, we're going to do it. Doesn't matter. It's open ended. That's, that's kind of what we do in our baptism. We're saying, I'm going to follow him all the way to death. In other words, there's nothing in this life that I'm going to hold back or hold before Yahweh all the way to the grave. In any way, martyrdom, whatever it is, I'm going to follow him and everything. I'm going to place nothing before him. Y'all got that? Do we do that? I hope we do. I hope we're not still fact. I hope we're turning to it with all we have. And that's kind of the principle. that he may establish you today for a people unto himself, that he may be unto thee an Elohim, as he has said unto thee, and as he has sworn unto thee, fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, neither with you only do I make this covenant, and if so, with him that standeth here with us this day, before Yahweh, also him 
that is not here with us this day. For you know how we have dealt in the land of Egypt and have come up through the nations which you passed by. So basically, those that are not there, they made that covenant for us with Yahweh just the same as if we were there when that covenant was cut. Those that are not here with us today, is that us? Is that future generations that that covenant was made? Yes. yes. And we're entering back into that covenant through the two of them. Exactly. That's the covenant, the promise that we have. That he will be our Elohim and we will be his people. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. This is where Yahweh predicts the, uh, the transgression of the turning of people. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the cursings which I set before thee, that thou shalt call them to mind among the nations where Yahweh the Elohim has driven thee. And thou shalt return unto Yahweh the Elohim and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. You and your children with all your heart and with all your soul. I believe that turn is happy. That Yahweh thy Elohim will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon me and return thee and gather thee from all the nations whether Yahweh the Elohim has scattered thee. And if any of you be driven unto the outermost parts of heaven from there, Yahweh thy Elohim will gather thee. And from thence will, will he fetch thee. From there we will fetch you. And Yahweh the Elohim will bring you into the land which he swore to your fathers, land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will do good and multiply you above all your fathers. And Yahweh your Elohim will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your life. He's going to bring us back. He is the one that's turning the steel net that's going to bring us because we rebelled. This return will it take place at the end of time? Or did this take place way back there in Yonkers? Let's go to Matthew 24, 30. And let's look at what he says there. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and they shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and his great majesty. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branches are yet every he put up his leaves, and though summer is not. So likewise, when you see all these things, know it is near, even at the end. He's going to come and he's going to fetch his people from all over the world. He's going to bring them home to the land. It's going to be known. Well, first we go to Mark 13, 26. Let's look at the passage in Mark. And then you shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and splendor. Then he shall send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, the other most part of the earth, to the other most part of heaven. I guess that's his name, but whatever. The greater exodus, or this end time exodus, and there's a lot of people that don't believe in the greater exodus. I'm a greater exodus type guy. I believe in the end time. They're always going to come. This is going to happen. He's going to gather the people and he's going to. He's going to lead us back to our land. A lot of people don't think that we're in captivity today. They think that uh, just because we've been here so long, and Israel has been so lost and so scattered throughout the nations, they think that this is actually our, our home, that our home is not over there where he has promised the tribes. I certainly hope that we're part of those tribes. And we're part of the ones that are in those 12 gates of the New Jerusalem, and that we are really part of Israel, and we were really part of those covenants. 
and that's us. So Jeremiah 16, 14. You know, this greater exodus starts with you turning your heart back to Yahweh or the people. Therefore, behold, the days come, saying, Yahweh, that shall no more be said. Yahweh liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. What? Man, we're not going to remember Passover anymore? We're not going to remember the deliverance of Egypt? This is going to be so great, it's going to eclipse the deliverance of Egypt? So think about that a minute. Passover is a pretty big deal, brother. But when Yahweh liveth, that brought the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands which he had driven them, and I will bring them again to their land, and I will give it unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith Yahweh, and they shall fish them. And after I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt for them. From every mountain, and from every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks, for my eyes are upon all their rocks. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from my eyes. He's going to purge them. First he said he's going to reconvince their iniquity. And he's going to purge them. And he's going to bring them back to their land. And then he's going to eclipse the coming out of Egypt of the river of Egypt. That's got to be something pretty colossal coming in the future. And I think this world Believe it or not, it's sitting on the preface of some really climatic things coming down the pipe. If, if you, I mean, you better get off the fake news and start telling the wind because things are coming. I think, I think huge things. Can we finish that chapter? Because there's some really good stuff in 1920 and 21. Okay. At first I will recompense their iniquities and their sins double because they have defiled my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. You know what the detestable and abominable things are? Not just idols, but it's also food, isn't it? Wrong food. The detestable and abominable things that Peter saw coming down in the vision. Oh, Yahweh, my strength and my fortress. My refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanities, and things wherein there is no profit. And we inherited lies, Christmas, Easter, <coughs> the uh, tooth fair. <laughs> <laughs> we raise our children lying to them, tell them this fat guy comes down the chimney and leaves them present. <laughs> and then we wonder why they don't believe us when we try to tell them bad things are going to happen to them. You know why kids don't believe that crack cocaine is so dangerous? Because they lied to them so desperately about marijuana. They see that it's really not that bad. And then when there's something really bad comes along since they were lied to, then they think that's not that bad. And yes, it is. So they they fall into that. Realize what the clouds of snowflakes are falling from, people. That, that's something to think about, isn't it? Who laid that snotty little... <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> shall, so shall a man make an Elohim unto himself. They are no Elohim. They're not Elohim. They're going to they're gonna make a God. The word Elohim is God. They're going to make a God unto themselves. That are not Elohim. That are not God. Basically, most of us make ourselves the God because we place ourselves above Yahweh. So if I'm going to make a God, why I should be me? You know, because I place myself above Yahweh, I'm actually making myself a God. Y'all know what I'm saying? I'm the idol. Don't I want to be idolized? I'm somebody. Therefore, behold, I will this once call them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my mind, and they shall know that my name is Yahweh. Hallelujah. Yeah, his name. He 
is the power. And I come in the name of the King, or I come into the top of the name of the law. Stop in the name of Yahweh. The real power. By the authority. Leviticus 26, 32. This turning of our hearts back to Yahweh from this end time thing and what we've got going on. Mm -hmm. I will bring them into the land. I will bring the land into desolation. And your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the heathen and drive a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your city's way. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lies desolate and you be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. Did you realize that actually happened for 70 years when they were taken to Babylon and the land had its rest? Yep. The reason they were put away is for not keeping the land rest. The land found the Shemitah. So the land actually had its rest. Yahweh had to remove them off of it so it rest. Well, they never had the faith to keep that seventh year of Sabbath. Y'all realize that? They didn't have the faith that they could let their land go fallow and still leave. <coughs> they didn't think Yahweh would keep them. They didn't exercise any faith for them. Where did end? How did that end for them? Well, I'll tell you what. If you don't have faith that y'all is going to take care of you because you think you have to work, you better look at some of these examples of what went down in Scripture. Brother Al? Yeah. Question. Uh, about the land resting. Uh, I haven't seen the pictures, but I heard that uh, like the graces are like Destroy them, 
utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for I am Yahweh their Elohim. But I will, for their sake, remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their Elohim, and I am Yahweh. These are the statutes and judgments of all that Yahweh made between him and the children of Israel and Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Keep going to remember those covenants. After the land remembers her sad. After the punishment that happened. That's really going to happen. I really, 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 really believe that's going to happen. You know, the Sabbath is all about returning and returning our heart to Yahweh. <laughs> we can read the Shema. Love Yahweh with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Repentance, turning back to Yahweh, is the theme of the Sabbath. Reaching and overcoming sin, <coughs> repenting and overcoming sin is the message that are repeated over and over and over throughout the scriptures. The struggle to overcome sin. That's the black man's time. Ever since Adam and Eve, ever since the very beginning, we have struggled with this flesh to overcome sin. And when we sin, it distances us from Yahweh and it, 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 it drives us away from His throne and His grace. As we see it, it widens that breach between us. Repentance is the act of returning. Repentance can also mean returning to one's self, your real self. The concept is that when we are in sin, we are actually tormented and we really never know peace. <coughs> As long as we're in sin, we're not really in peace. They're knowing ourselves, the struggle that we have. In John 14, 27, the Messiah makes a statement. I believe he's talking to his disciples here. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In other words, when we get Yahweh and we turn back to Yahweh, we start to come into our real self and start to know peace. A peace that defies understanding. A peace of calmness. That when you face these obstacles, there's a calmness and actually facing these atrocities in the world that you see other people fall apart. We turn to Yahweh and we have this piece. First Timothy 6, 5. Anyone loves me will 
keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him, and make a home with him. Uh, he will keep my word, his mind. John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If I kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. 1 John 2, 4. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of Elohim. We keep his commandments, his commandments are not burdensome. I want to go to 2 John 1, 6. And this is the love that we walk after his commandments, and this is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. What, what commandments were we hearing from the very beginning? That would have been the Torah, wouldn't it? It should be obvious that God or Elohim defines keeping of his commandments. Love. This is love. This is why when Yeshua was talking to the Pharisees and he says, You draw near to me with your mouth, but you honor me not with your lips. I mean, you honor me with your lips, uh, but your heart is far from me. You see, the love is keeping the commandments. Keeping the commandments. The lip service of, yeah, I love you, but I'm not going to do anything to tell me. That's exactly what they were doing. That's the game a lot of people in this walk are playing. I'm not really keeping the whole law, but I'm saying I love him. I show up on Shabbat. I sing the songs. But as far as keeping the law, nah. Nah, that's good. Go when you finish that, he says, because you keep the, the commandments of men. Now you finish, he said, you keep the commandments of men, not my commandments. Well, we say we love him, but we don't keep his law, do we? We don't keep his law. You know, he goes through a thing here. I want to do this right quick. I want to go to back to Deuteronomy 32 1. And I want to run through a little bit of this thing. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. That's Moses talking to heaven and to earth to speak. Right? Who is the owner of heavens and earth? Let's say Yahweh is the possessor of heaven and earth. In other words, it's his, he owns it, he made it. He owns heaven and earth. Moses here. As a matter of fact, the first thing is created. It says in the beginning, Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, didn't it? In other words, they witnessed the creation or the making of all creation, heaven and earth. In Deuteronomy 4, 26, Moses is calling on heaven and earth here again. I want to some of heaven and earth stuff here. 4, 26. He said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you should soon early perish across the land unto where you go over Jordan to possess if you shall not prolong your days upon it, you shall utterly be destroyed. What he's saying is, what he's telling them here is he's calling heaven and earth to witness that they're going to be destroyed if they don't keep the law of the covenant. That's what he's telling them here. Now I want to go to Deuteronomy 30.19. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore choose life that both you and your seed may live. In other words, he's calling heaven and earth as a witness, right? 
Let's go to Deuteronomy 32 1. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. And he's saying, he's calling heaven and earth again to listen and to talk. In Isaiah 1 2, Isaiah is actually, believe it or not, a court case that's happening between Yahweh and the people because he tried to tell them what they're doing wrong in all three books of Isaiah. When Isaiah said, The vision of Isaiah, the sign is which I saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, hear, O heaven, and give ear, O earth, for Yahweh has spoken, and I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. He's calling the witnesses to this proclamation of the book. Is what he's doing. Heaven and earth. They witnessed creation. Moses called them to witness the covenants, and they witnessed these covenants. In Matthew 5.18, it makes a statement here by the Messiah, and he, he makes a statement here about heaven and earth in Matthew 5.18. He says, For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. As long as the witnesses are here to those covenants and to that law, that law is in effect. You don't see that. That heaven and earth are here to witness those covenants. Luke 16, 17. Luke 16, 17. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. So heaven and earth. It's easier for them to pass than it is for the law to fail. The law, the law seems to be connected to heaven and earth. In Revelation 20, verse 11, at the white throne judgment, something's going to happen to the heaven and earth here. And I saw a great white throne in heaven set on it, the face of the earth and heaven fled away and there's found no place for them anymore. The heaven and earth fled away. Why did heaven and earth flee away in the day of this judgment? Could it be that no one is going to bring a charge to Yahweh's elect? <coughs> Second Peter 3.13 Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for a new heavens and a new earth for a new wealth of righteousness. This new heaven and new earth is not going to remember the oldness or the, or the witness against us. Revelation 21.1 And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from Elohim, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adored for her husband. And I heard a great voice in heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is sin, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim shall be with them, and they shall be their Elohim, and they shall wipe away tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, and more sorrow, and for the poor things that passed away. And he that sat upon the road said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, these are true and faithful, all things new. In other words, the new heaven and new earth. I thought they said new heaven. Verse 1. Verse 1. That's verse 1. I missed it. <laughs> okay, Isaiah 66, 22. Shall come and worship before me, saith Yahweh. So, the 
long as that moon, that heaven and earth is there, this law is going to be there. It's going to be in fact. And we're going to uh, keep that law unto Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. No, so we need to be content with Yahweh, our Master, wherever He places us, wherever He desires us to be. If we yield to our Master, He'll place us in a place where we can be of His service, where He'll take care of us and love us. And that might be uh, the place that we would like for it to be. Sometimes when we read about the sufferings that went on of the patriarchs and those that went before us, we kind of forget the turning to Yahweh and the things that we need to do for Yahweh. We need to be, if you will, content. I know that Joseph uh, could have been maybe a little angry that he was sold into slavery. That he spent, I think, 17 years basically a slave. How many of those in prison? Sold by his brothers. Yet, uh, through all of that being done and him being falsely uh, accused, and what all happened to him, he didn't hold any guile towards his brothers. After all that happened. Think about the position that he was placed in and what all went to him and what so many of the prophets went through. Ezekiel laid on his side for 390 days on his right side. 40 days on his left side. He had to cook his food over cow dung for all that time. If you see somebody doing that out here, would you think, boy, that's a property job? That's a real. But I would tell you what, think of the heart, think of the service. I want you to think about where he placed these people and what they did in service to Yahweh. Isaiah walked barefoot and naked for three years. That's Isaiah 20, verse 2. The one with Ezekiel is Ezekiel 4 4 through 15. Is that story? Barefoot and naked for three years. I don't know if you'd be arrested for that today, but in past days you probably would have been. But think about it. If I think somebody out here walking around barefoot and nude, I wouldn't say, boy, there's a prophet. <laughs> <coughs> Jeremiah was thrown into the slime pit. Jeremiah 38 6. He was beat up too. Yahweh let him be beat up. Thrown in a slime pit. Thrown in prison. Dealt with in all that way. Do you want to say something, Victor? Yeah, I remember now the impact of the prophets. Uh, one of the prophets got among him to eat human pieces. The prophet said, Can I eat some of uh, you from the colonies? <laughs> Jeremiah wore a wooden yoke around his neck for 13 years, I think, prophesying that Israel would be under the yoke of the king of Babylon. You can do the numbers on that on where that The false prophet took it off of him and took it away. You know, Daniel, taken to the king's court as a young man, believed to be, if you will, like a eunuch in the king's court. Uh, when I think of all these things, I don't really think of protection. Y'all are really taking care of me. You know, it's definitely not the Western mindset of protection. Is we do not have those visions. Do we? But you'd have to say they were all taken care of by Yahweh. 
place where he wanted them in a situation he wanted them to be in. Again, we do not have, I don't know, do we have that bait? Do we have that turning? Do we have that? You know, they were, according to Matthew 23, 30, they were all martyrs. Go to Matthew 23, 30. All the prophets. Is that why John the Baptist had to be martyred? Was he a prophet? Did he have to meet his doom in that way for this prophecy to come to pass? In other words, he couldn't live a right old age? The reason he wasn't delivered? That's a good question, isn't it? And I say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them of the blood of the prophets. Wherefore you be witness unto yourselves that you are the children of them that killed the prophets. For you shall fill up the measure of your fathers. You servants, you generation of bikers, how can you expect the damnation of the hand? They were pretty religious people. The Pharisees were. They had a lot of religious dogma, didn't they? All the disciples, with the exception of John, met that faith. And I understand they tried to kill him a couple times. Revelation 24 talks about that great whore, that great city. It says that in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all that were slain upon the earth. Yeah. I don't know who that is. The great whore. Yeah. What about those that cry out under the throne? It says, you know, y'all, y'all hold on because till the rest of them, I don't know who the rest are, till the rest are killed the same way y'all are. You know? All this the other pleasant stuff to look at is what if your lot is to come before that sword and have to give your life? If you haven't exercised your faith in the small things, I do not believe you're going to do it in the big things. I believe you're going to fold up like, you know, like a cheap suitcase. It's going to be all over. You, you will not, I believe, go through with that. I don't know where the end is. We're just going on and on. You go. Trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations. Yeah. John 23 10. Let's stop here. John 20, uh, Job 23. Yeah. I was going to say, look, it seems like most of the tribulations come from your family or from your brother. Cool. Prophets that, were killed by the brother. That was there. He who loves father, mother, sister more than me. In other words, are we going to let our family separate us from Yahweh? Am I going to say, no, I can't because I have to go do daddy, daddy, da with? In other words, if I play that family member above Yahweh, I'm loving him more than Yahweh. It doesn't matter what you place above Yahweh's law. It doesn't matter what it is. If you place it above Yahweh, you've just made that an idol. I don't care what it is. And it may be something you like to do. Make water skiing an idol. Well, I didn't want to go water skiing last Sabbath. I didn't want to go speak with Yahweh. What you, it doesn't matter. It's anything that you place there is, is your idol. And we can learn all kinds of things about idols. How they the heart. Talks over and over and over. There's all kinds of scripture talks about the idols of the heart. <coughs> but I desire to do. Further out. Further out. Do, uh, we um, so, some. I've heard some some uh, teachers get real, real hard nosed and dogmatic about the Sabbath. Does uh, does the Father take the Sabbath? as serious as some of the teachers we have access to on YouTube? I mean, the, there's 52 Sabbaths a year. Does he, does our Heavenly Father have to have every one of those? Does he have to have us here? Can we only come here and keep the Sabbath? I mean, can't we go uh, to Silver Dollar City and keep the Sabbath, one of them there, in our hotel room? You want to ask that one by us here? That's the day comes. What are you going to do? Huh? So if we miss one, and that's the day the sun's coming, what are we going to do? 
Well, he won't come except for a piece of trunk. So see, we can squig we can squiggle around. <laughs> you know, we can always squiggle around and, and say, well, you know, I, what I'll do, I'll find a, I, I'll stay in my room and read scripture. And, and or you no, know, my 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 aunt my aunt's uh, getting married, uh, or her or my 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 sister's daughter's getting married. I want to go to that wedding. Or my my nephew's graduate. Or he's going on. He's going to play a really good football game, and he need, it really means a lot for him to, for me to be there. Do we do we find ways to? Is it okay if we find ways to not meet with the Father on the Sabbath? Do we have to do it His way? I guess is what I'm asking. Well, some people say that you can meet with Him anywhere, any way, any time. The connection is you calling Him, not. God. Uh, I listen to a video on that that I disagree with so much. I get a vehemently disagree that you can summon up Yahweh. Yeah. The connection or the uh, the micro is a connection with Yahweh, but the connection is me 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 bringing me in Yahweh up and say. Y'all come on down here because I'm over here today. So I'm not going to him, he's coming to me. I think that whole concept is so foreign that it blows my mind that anybody even has it, that I can that I can just call up Yahweh and some of things come to me. I believe the whole thing about a micro and a, and these, these things are you coming to him, not him coming to you. We're turning to him, we're going to him, we're serving him. That this whole concept of he's coming to me now he says that where two or three are going together he'd be in the midst of them so i think that that complication is a getting together with other people i don't believe a man and a wife or a convocation i believe that too is one flesh but i believe if it's possible for you to convene on the shabbat day you should convene with somebody else well let me ask what i believe let me and so you. Yahweh, while you're doing it, that doesn't mean get together with my buddy and go to the bar, or or go fishing, or go. You know, I enjoy fishing. They want me to have a good time on Sabbath, so let's go fishing. Or let's go water skiing, or let's go. No. Well, let me ask you this. What well, I mean, it seems like when, every time someone dies in our family, there there's um, everybody always chooses to bury them on the sab on, on the Sabbath. That would be okay, would it? To, to forego the Sabbath with the Father to go to a funeral, right? Whatever you think, God. No, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, I know what I think. I know where my convictions lie. But is that some, I mean, because that's, that's, a, that's a real life situation that we're faced with. That's a real life situation. People get married on the <coughs> Sabbath, people graduate on the Sabbath. Yeah, you know, the WWJD, well, let's do the WWYD. What would Yeshua do? I don't know what Jesus is going to do, but what would we don't Yeshua do? What did Yeshua mean when he said, let the dead bury the dead? When someone said, I'm not going to go and do what you want me to do because I've got to, my dad just died, I need to go to that funeral. And Yeshua said to him, let the dead bury the dead. What is Yeshua talking about there? Is that symbolic, or does he mean that literally? I believe he literally meant that. Oh, really? Just like the high priest couldn't defile himself, only for his father and mother could he defile himself. Aaron couldn't even attend to his son. Okay. That's a serious commitment. Not only did he not uh, wasn't allowed to attend to his children, he still had to do the service for Yahweh. In the, in the reflection of his two sons. Are you talking about Aaron's two sons that died? He died. Right. Not only did they die right before, he had to do the service for Yahweh. You know, Moses looked over and Yahweh looked over the fact that he didn't make the sin sacrifice that day. But he was even questioned about it. If you want to read the narrative. That would be Leviticus 10. Leviticus 10. Richard? Uh, what 
John was talking about, about Nicotine containers about these two centers. Unless it's the the feast from the students on me. But we're only commanding you know, commands the males three times a year. Okay, we're only commanded. I guess you did the I know what I want to sound like the bare minimum, right? To be there for those three times before Tabernacle uh pass on unleavened and pen chavo and and Sukho. Um so he, yeah, but you should try to be here as much as you can. You have to do something. I think he's, he obviously set aside those three that was, where he says we have to come. You know, we have to. So that's, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. No, you're a commanded to come before him. The Sabbath is a commanded assembly. Those are commanded to come to his dwelling. In other words, your hog or your feast day, your free pilgrimage journey, or to appear before him in the place that he chooses for you to come to appear. But we can't go to, you know. But the, the Sabbath, in my opinion, is just merely a get together. In other words, come together and worship God. It doesn't designate a place, it designates the, the coming together. And that, that coming together for a purpose of worshiping God. Uh, two or three is the number. That, that's all you need to come together to worship God. That's so, the way I understand it. So if you're by yourself and you're in a family gathering where you've been invited, what do you do? You I don't think go. you should find a place where you can get together with another believer. Is there a scripture somewhere that says heaven and earth are Can't do things. If the person's isolated, you can't meet, you can't meet. 
I think y'all way looks over it if you are totally isolated and can't find anybody to meet with. Yahweh understands us where we are, what we're doing. Ezekiel was out there boo hoo at the when Ezekiel was. Yeah, but if I. I'm the only one boo hoo hoo hoo. You know, he didn't have anybody to meet with. I, I can't imagine being totally isolated in the world like that. But Yahweh understands your situation, and, and he knows your heart. He really does know your heart. Yeah, but. I have a lot of friends there. His house will be full of lots of people on the weekends. On the Sabbath, am I supposed to drink wine and um, just act like yeah. it's another day? Yeah. I mean, I'm confused. The Sabbath is set apart for the worship of God. What you choose to do is your choice. The, the, the Sabbath day is sanctified for the service of the Lord. So do I go to my room and stay in there and worship all day? You I'm know, sorry I, I'm making, I just need to understand. Well, you're giving a scenario that I really can't answer. Uh, I know what I would do, but... Uh, what would you do? What would I do? Yes. I would participate with them some, but I wouldn't participate with them all day. You know, in other words, if I was with family on a Shabbat day, I would participate with my family some, but I would still try to meet or to be with another believer on that day. Uh, I wouldn't just totally lock myself away from the world. I don't think y'all would want to just lock myself away from the world. You know, we, we have the possibility of doing more damage than we do good. Yeah. We have to be very careful and tender not to do damage. Right. So to, I think to completely break away from them and say, you know, your demons would be wrong. So I, I kind of agree with Al that you you don't want to do damage. You know, so participating or being with them, but not partaking of the pagan celebrations, both can happen at the same time. My neighbor come over. My neighbor come over after I moved before I have. They, they, the one Christmas, this little girl come over there and she had some Christmas cookies. Now I could have just thrown them back in the pagan. Get out of here! <laughs> I, I took her cookie. Right. Because it was I just said, you let her know. Spirit. I said, you know, we don't celebrate Christmas. Right. But I did take her cookie. Uh, <laughs> and I, you know, man, man, hope you're good. You got some more. <laughs> no, cookie's a cookie. <laughs> no, seriously, they're like I say. I, I would, you know, but I would try to move and worship y'all that day. Uh, Even if it's the Sabbath day Adventist. Now, sometimes you might be in a situation where there might be an absolute impossibility, but still, you can say something. You can pray to Yahweh. Yahweh, you know, there's a place that I would just. Don't go my family and hide in the corner somewhere either. And sometimes letting your light shine and letting them know why you do what you do. Amen. Why you believe not in a haughty way, but in a very humble way. You might you might be able to shine some light on them. Well, I have just told my brother what I've joined the assembly. I've been baptized. I feel so unworthy that God has led me here. And I praise Him every day for that. And I've explained this to my brother. And like I said, he, I don't really know what he believes. But he said, you have some celebrations coming up, don't you? Well, that just thrilled my heart. Now, what do you think for a That's right, he's just playing And he puts a light inside. And then he breaks that vessel ever so gently to let that light shine through. But that destroys the vessel. As he works on us, it's a little by little. 
you navigate a minefield in this world. Uh, pray to him. Uh, ask him to lead you through the Spirit. I believe that every situation, I don't believe there's a cut and dry situation. I believe the Spirit will lead you into these situations. And nobody can just cookie cutter say, do this, do that, do this, do that. And that's a big place, so I should find something. <laughs> I, you know, there, there's no cookie cutter pattern to anybody's walk. I believe all of our walks are made by, by Yahweh for you individually just for you to become that vessel he wants you to be. The trying of your fight, the, the, if you will, the. Do you ever hear the story of, of the, 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 uh, the trier of silver as, as the, the sterling silver? They asked the old silversmith, said, when do you know when the silver's right? And he said, well, I watch over the silver and I have to be careful because if I put too much fire on it, I'll burn the silver. You know, and if I don't put enough, I won't get all the dross off of the silver. So the fire has to be just right. So I have to watch that silver and be sure the fire is just right. Not too hot, not too cold. Or I'll destroy the silver. It won't be sterling. And he said, well, how do you know when it's finished? And he said, when I see my reflection in the silver. Uh, Yahweh says, I said, in the refiner silver. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Ricky? I just figured it's not a lot of shoe, but Second uh, Chronicles 7 14, where he says, If my people, all my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and forgive them and heal their sins. Heal my people will turn. All of my mind. I will turn. Right. Yeah, turn. Yeah. Go ahead. This past two weeks, I've been
and I'm sharing it with you. Anybody else have something else to add or something else to add? Okay, let's look. You have a record for Yahweh by each year. Yeah, Yahweh lift up his calendar of the throne and give him the 